Welcome to this short tutorial on using Global Illumination in Houdini. First of all, what is Global Illumination? Well, it's a term used for various different methods in computer graphics to make lighting more like the real world. Here's an example. I've got a scene here with a room with a single small window. There's a light shining into the room with depth map, map shadows enabled and a camera that's set up inside the room. If we just do a normal render without any global illumination, this is what we get. Only the area directly illuminated by the window is lit up. We know this is unrealistic. In real life, the walls around the room would also be lit by lighting, reflecting off the bright areas on the wall. Here's the same scene rendered using global illumination. As you can see, the results are much more like the real world. This tutorial is going to look at how to use different methods to approximate global illumination using Houdini's default renderer mantra. It does not cover mantra's physically based renderer, PBR renderer, which operates differently, though there is some overlap, as we'll discover. All the methods available are approximations to real global illumination. Indeed, any rendering method is more or less a cheat the question is how much render time you're prepared to use to achieve a good looking result. More complicated forms of approximation in Houdini, um, ambient occlusion, full irradiance and path tracing. The difference between full irradiance and path tracing is mainly one of the method of calculation. Path tracing, tracing uses the PBR rendering engine, uh, while full irradiance uses the normal rendering engine. Both offer capabilities that are similar to what is called final gathering and photon mapping in other applications. To use any of these with the standard ment renderer, we need to set up a special light source. This is a two-step process. First, go to your shader operator network, shop, and use the tab menu to lay down a fix global illumination shader. Then go back to your object level and lay down a light template. Under the shaders tab, uh, we need to pick the light shader that we just laid down. By clicking on the arrow, we can go straight to the shader parameters. You might ask why we use a light shader to simulate global illumination, rather than having settings in the renderer as other applications do. Well, for one thing, this is just a standard light, so you can use light linking to enable and disable global illumination for different objects. So back to the parameters. The main option is the drop-down menu, Irradiance Style. This lets you determine what method to use to simulate global illumination. Uh, by the way, Irradiance is just the term for light reflected off an object. So global illumination is really all about calculating irradiance, the light reflected on a second bounce off an object. No irradiance, uh, which is the first option, obviously turns irradiance off, though it can be used to visualize photon maps, uh, as we'll see later. Ambient occlusion is the most basic form of global illumination. A brief explanation of how it works. Here we have a typical scene with an object, a light, and a wall. In normal rendering, we take the point we're shading and just look at the illumination coming directly from the light. In ambient occlusion, we do the direct light calculation, but we also add some extra light. We do this by shooting out rays of fixed length from the point we are shading. These are called samples. If they hit anything, then they count as dark, and if they don't hit anything, they count as light. We add light to the point being rendered depending on how many rays hit objects. So back to the global illumination light parameters. Just to recap, we've laid down a global, global illumination light shader and we've laid down a light template, which is basically just an empty light, and set it so that the shader is the global illumination shader. Uh, we then control uh, the global illumination in the scene using that light shader. I'm going to change the samples parameter to something small. 
I'm also going to change the maximum intersection distance to something smaller. At the moment this very large number means that the render will in effect test out to an almost infinite distance for other objects. And since our teapot is enclosed in a room, uh, it's almost everywhere going to be blocked. So we're not going to get much effect from the ambient occlusion. If I change it to a lower value, it's more likely to ignore the walls of the room, except where the object is close to them. So let's do a render and see how that looks. As you can see, this is one step up from using ambient light. Ambient occlusion doesn't pay any attention to where the light may be reflected from, or what colour the light might be, may be, but it does pay attention to how much a point is occluded or blocked by nearby objects. It's often good enough as a fake, and the total amount of light entering the scene can be adjusted using the global tint parameter at the top. Let's have a look at some different renders to show the effect of increasing uh, the maximum intersection distance. So here we have the image that we've just rendered with a maximum distance of 2. This is what it looks like with a maximum distance of 8 and 14 and finally with a maximum distance of 20. As you can see the last two are quite similar because with anything above 10 uh, the rays are always hitting the walls of the enclosing building. Ambient occlusion is pretty fast to calculate but as we move up to some of the other methods of calculating global illumination render time does become an issue. There are two ways that you can reduce render time in Houdini. The first is to use the adaptive sampling checkbox here on the global illumination light. This allows the renderer to take less samples if it thinks it can get away with it. Here's an example. I've taken two images, one with adaptive sampling on and then with adaptive sampling off. As you can see, the difference is imperceptible. But on my machine, at least, the render time is reduced by around 50% with adaptive sampling on. The second method is irradiance caching. This stores irradiance, or global illumination information, and if a point being shaded is nearer enough to another point where irradiance has already been calculated, then that value will be reused rather than redoing the calculation. It can be quite tricky to set up. Uh, now you find it under the Properties tab of the Mantra Renderer node. There are three parameters here. The first is a general accuracy parameter. Reducing this will increase render times, but also make a more accurate image. The second and third parameters determine how wide a circle of other points can be taken into account. As you can see, they are measured in pixels. Lowering the maximum distance value will force more samples to be computed. Uh, this creates a more accurate representation of the irradiance information, but again takes longer. So essentially a higher value in this parameter will produce a more blurry global illumination representation and a smaller value, a more accurate one. The other parameter, the minimum distance, tries to prevent clustering of sampling points which might create artifacts in the renderer. In general, 1.5 is a good value. Here's a sequence of images which show the effect of changing uh, the maximum distance parameter from 5 up to 20. The first of these images is rendered using a maximum spacing value of 20. And if we zoom in, uh, we can see there are some pretty significant artifacts here caused by the fact that we're using such a big radius. If we have a look at the same image uh, rendered using a maximum spacing of uh, 10, we can see that the artifacts are much reduced and it's a pretty good image. And finally, have a look at an image which is rendered uh, with a maximum spacing of 5. And you can see that uh, those artifacts almost completely disappeared. And we're getting a pretty realistic image.